So, uh, Florian Klega, thanks a lot for your time and congratulations on your film. It was very dynamic. Um, a story of Sahel sounds. And um, as I would describe it, it's basically about you guys basically follow Chris Kirkley, mm -hmm. who's kind of a scrappy DJ and music, indie music producer and um, normal white guy from the United States as he tours around um, Northern Africa in search of local musicians who aren't really well known. Um, and there, I thought there was, it's interesting, there's a very wide spectrum. You had young and old musicians, you had female and male musicians, yeah, so it was sure. interesting to hear this kind of, and even different genres. I mean, some are using guitars, yeah. some are doing synthesizers. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I would summarize it. Is that, did I get that pretty much how you see it as well? Totally, yeah. That was, I think that already touched a pretty uh, important point of, of his work and maybe the film. Okay, great. So your, your film is part road trip, part extended music video. Mm -hmm. Um, what is it then in the film that you know, propels the film forward? Because it's not a traditional narrative structure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think first of all, <coughs> that comes probably from the fact that when we, I mean, we discovered Chris and his label basically around the time when he released his first records. The most uh, still, I think up to date, is uh, the most uh, um, well-known one is the Saharan Cell Phones compilation. It was, I think, the first compilation was his uh, his second release on vinyl. But um, so at that time, we kind of discovered the the label and the music, and we followed it with uh, by listening to the music and stuff. But um, the time when we actually decided to make a documentary about him and contacted him and asked him if we could like. If, if that can work out in some way. Um, the label and everything had already progressed. And especially like something that we touch a little bit in the film, but not too much is like the whole trip that he did in the beginning, which basically initialized the whole project that he went to, uh, to the Western part of Africa in like 2009 and 10 and stayed for b basically two years. And that was the f time when he collected kind of most of the stuff that he, uh, that he released later on. So, uh, so we knew we can only grasp like, a, like a, a short moment in, his, in the progressing of his label. And we also knew that we didn't want it to do like a whole um, structure just around his big story. Because for us it was also important uh, to have the musicians that we are going to meet. Uh, on a trip that we were doing. So I think that were maybe the limitations that made it a bit more difficult to structure that film. And I have to say, to be honest, when we went for the, for the different shooting blocks, we had not too much of a clue what this film was going to be. And we also didn't really bother. So we kind of liked the idea of jumping into the, the cold water and just uh, see what we're gonna get, and then afterwards, in the editing process, somehow find a way how to make a film uh, about it. Which, now that the film is finished and it's fine and I'm kind of proud of it, I think, uh, well, good, but I remember also the time when we, were, uh, when we were editing or when we were looking through the rushes that we kind of realized, like, oh my God, like, how can we build like, a narrative out of this? Mm -hmm. Right, because you, you, have, you have the, uh, the danger of just shooting forever and not... Yes, you know, and also like, I mean, during the trips, I mean, we had experience in filmmaking, in documentary filmmaking, but also not that we were, that we felt like totally professional and we knew, okay, we need this shot and that shot and we need a, need a shot of this and like a sound of that. It was more like, okay, let's just... I think it was mainly out of intuition what we shot and also because uh, it was the, the three of us that were doing all the, the, the shooting blocks together. Okay. So we had usually two cameras and, uh, and a sound engineer. Um, so each of us also like kind of shot different things, you know, and felt 
things differently and we let each other a lot of freedom to do whatever we wanted. But then of course later in the, in the editing process it was a quite a tough time to bring everything together mm -hmm. so that it works. I, if you could go back in time and redo it, would you do it the same way or would you come in with a different structure? I mean, I know you gain lots of knowledge along the way, but, or, or for example, in your next project, are you going to do the same approach? Also, thinking of the financials, I mean, you have yeah, the yeah, budget and all yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. Maybe so and so, like, because, I mean, just for the process, I think that is something that we were also doing on projects before. And to me, it feels like something that I, that I kind of uh, admire also because it maybe goes a little bit against like what let's say conventional filmmaking is taught a lot of times like I remember in my time at my school where something like this if I would told that to a teacher and be like oh this is this is how I'm go I want to do it they would never let me shoot it that way they would be like you know there has to be a script there has to be a structure you have to research more like you will come back with nothing if you do it that way but I don't really believe that I believe very much in like the 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 intuition of like a of the filmmaker let's say and that he's able to I think he's able to capture something that's much deeper if he just um, like if he if he if he's not really rely or if it's not too much relying on like let's say rules and 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 structured or fixed things but more like on on feelings and and just I don't know like inter interacting with his protagonist and whoever he meets in front of his camera. You describe the film as being basically without a director. That's how you described it last night in the yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. So if there's no director what's your role? What's the role of the Neo Pan Collective mm -hmm. and um, who's behind the film? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I say there's no director, of course, it's maybe a bit exaggerated. Um, what I mean with that is mainly that, that I would say that the film was directed by the collective, which is, I think, most of the time different to other films that, that specifically credit or name someone who, who, who gets this directing credit. Because, uh, I mean, for us, it's also something that's not really important. I mean, we don't need like our names or, or a specific name for that credit but uh, but in the sense that like how the film was made is that the idea the shooting everything was done in between several people mm -hmm. and it was not one mastermind that was uh, well you do describe um, at least last night you described that there's four of you in the collective yeah, and, yeah. and for this project there was three yeah, yeah. and you all have different let's say uh, we have the technical backgrounds, yeah. right? Different technical backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did, how did that? How did you guys play mm -hmm. with those competencies? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as I said, like uh, there's uh, there's Toby who's a sound engineer, so it was it's kind of just natural that he was taking charge of the of the recordings. Then Marcus is a photographer, um, so he was doing the main camera, and uh, I come from editing but I also have some uh, camera work experience. So I was doing the second camera and also taking care, of course, of the material and making sure that everything is safe and stuff. Um, you want to say a word about the fourth protagonist? Uh, yeah, I mean, Lisa, she's, a, she's she studied at art school. She's maybe the most director of all of us. Um, but uh, for that project, she was already involved in another one. So that's why we decided, OK, the three of us will go for that one and she continued with hers. But for example, the film that the collective did before was a, a collaboration between her and me, okay. and the others were more in the background, just helping a little bit with So stuff. from that background, what is the role of, I mean, what is the collective? Is it a legal entity no, or is no. it just a, a network? How, yeah. I mean, what is it? I mean, basically it's just four friends that, that were working together over time and we knew each other since a long time and very well. So we just decided at one point that we will use one name to release kind of all the different projects that we are working on. And, and why? What's the advantage of that? Well, good question. <laughs> um, the advantage to us, I think, is that, that maybe our works get 
connected more and are more like uh, how do you like like tunnel or something, yeah, focused, or something. Fo focused um, and maybe we can spread the name through this one collective name more than if it would be the individ individual uh, uh, projects and so does that mean the collective is open for new members? Or it is. I mean, it, like the idea was that it's a completely open, interdisciplinary thing where, where basically everything can happen somehow, like that. Like no, no fixed roles in a way. Um, no, not not like an egocentrism on 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 that. Like okay, I need this credit or I want to be that person. It just. Yeah, just experience sharing and I mean, so far it's like since since we all are not really, let's say, uh, uh, wealthy or anything, so we have to make our living besides those like film uh, projects. The collective is not that active as we might wished in the beginning, but I mean, it still keeps going and there's new projects coming so okay great now the film from a technical um, perspective um, so you guys are in Africa mm -hmm. where the infrastructure is not the same as in Vienna or Germany or Paris mm -hmm. and uh, what what gear did you take with you or did you get there and particularly what are you using to capture you know the, the sound because that's such a crucial part of this yeah, film yeah. Um, well, in terms of the equipment, uh, like for the filming, we, we went with two DSLRs. We had like okay. Nikon's D800, I think, was it? Um, and a couple of different lenses? Or we actually had only, uh, like we had the both the fixed lenses that were on the, on the cameras and then we had one zoom lens that we bought, uh, a tele, so that we had like something different okay. for uh -huh. specific situations. So it was three lenses, the two cameras, and um, well, a bunch of small stuff. And uh, and for the sound, we had like a uh, like a handy recorder, a Zoom. Uh, I think two uh, and the eight really, the really small one. I think the H two N and the H four N. Yeah. Um, and then Toby, of course, had his sound device with a boom. Okay. And uh, and we had, I think, two laughs. Um, but it was all pretty much basic um, and not... Right, but that way, I mean, you've at least got... Um, and you can lab a couple of, of your protagonists up, like Chris and... Yeah, I mean, Chris was mic'd throughout the whole time, yeah. which I think was the biggest advantage, because a lot of times uh, when he was meeting people and talking with them, we could get the sound from the others, right, mostly both, both th people. through his laugh in the end, because a lot of the situations that we had and people that we met, it everything went so quickly and so, let's say, spontaneous that there was not really a moment where we could say, okay, let's stop before you start talking because we have to give him a mic first. And so it was a lot of booming. Um, and I think Toby did, like, in that sense, a really great job, like, running all the time. Yeah, with his hands up, yeah. yeah. And what was he recording that into? Uh, the boom was uh, recorded into a sound device, uh, which is like this, uh, I mean, sound device is the, 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 the brand, yeah. It's, it's kind of a, a, a four-track recorder, okay. digital. I mean, inside, I think it's... So he's recording the two labs in there, and then he's got his boom. Yeah, and, and, and the zooms we use mainly for the music performances. Okay, so, so you can put those in post then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing about the music uh, that we, like the performances that we recorded is that uh, we wanted to stay in the same way that Chris is usually working with the sound because I think something that's particularly interesting about his his recordings and his releases is that he mainly uses field recordings. Right. Um, I think he, had an he also had a zoom. I think one of the shots. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so I mean, his his record or like the the music that he records and releases is mainly recorded uh, either with a zoom or, of course, it's stuff that he copies from like cell phones or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there's never a studio recording or that he brings, let's say, bands or musicians into specific settings for their music because he's very keen about that the music is recorded and also uh, released in the form that it happened. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. and that yeah, image. yes, and like I mean that's a that's a I think a particular thing about field recordings that also a lot of the background noises, of course, are 
heard and like if there's a goat or like a TV running or a baby crying, that's just part of the atmosphere. And so that was kind of important for us to, to keep as well for the, for the sound recordings. Right. And, um, and I mean, the big advantage that we had in the end for the, for the mixing was that we were recording with uh, different microphones and of course also Chris, because I mean, he recorded all the sessions as well for his, wow. for his archive. So in the end, we had around four mics almost for every session that we could use. And since the Zoom uh, recorders nowadays even have like a surround uh, right. recording option, yeah. so sometimes we had like even a surround thing and then we put ours maybe pretty close to the guitar, Chris ones was more in the center, then Toby was still booming from above, so there were just different sound sources. And actually, I mean, it, it's a bit uh, uh, a bummer that, that they don't have a, a let's say a surround sound uh, system down there in the cinema, but well it, is true, yeah. it is released in 5.1 and in, 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 a, in a big cinema, it's actually it sounds amazing. Yeah, I never, I hadn't think about that, I hadn't thought about that, yeah. Because yeah. 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 yeah, I know you also released the sound as like, a, as like a soundtrack. Yes, yes, that as well, so. You have all these, I mean, like the sound quality on these small mm -hmm. uh, microphones is amazing, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're so practical, so why even take the boom? Because it seems like that would attract so much unnatural attention to what you're doing. It, it does, but like in the sense of, uh, of dialogue sound, it's really a huge difference between a shotgun mic and, uh, and like one of those recorders, because uh, as I said, with the lav, I mean, it was good that Chris always had one, so we had his voice and we could capture a lot of the others, but, um, but like a, a Zoom recorder is always capturing a very wide range around the microphones, and the boom with a shotgun, it's very directed. So, right, but if you're, you're usually recording one or two people, so you've got Chris on his lap and he's picking up his counterpart, do you really... But, f yeah, but like for example, a lot of time, like, like a scene in the, in the radio where we were just like walking around a lot of times, you know, and, uh, and there's a lot of music and noise and stuff, like the sound on the, on, on the left was, I mean, mainly only usable for Chris and then we had a... Uh, uh, if we would have used the zoom, it would probably just be in a weird ambience. And so with the um, with the boom mic, it's, it's you get a little more vocalized sound. Yeah, it really worked. And but that was worth the, the trade off. Uh, walking through the town and everybody following. Yeah, I mean, but that happens basically uh, anyways. Okay. So so I don't think that the boom was was uh, was making a big difference. Okay. <laughs> So another really interesting aspect of your film was that um, you you leveraged that's probably the great word you leveraged uh, crowd sourcing mm -hmm. crowd funding mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't entirely a crowd funded project but you leveraged that to kind of get things going can you start at the very beginning of that process because I know it didn't fulfill all of your financial needs yeah. but start at the beginning figure and tell us how you came up with a number. Then how did the why did you choose to do say crowd funding instead of I don't know a grant or you know, charging your credit card yeah, yeah. and then where that went to and then at the end you know how, how would you evaluate looking back this was a good option this is a bad option what are your recommendations yeah. for other filmmakers I mean first of all I think it's it's to a certain degree it's kind of it started as an let's say an amateur project so we were really like just we had this idea we thought if we somehow managed to find enough money for that we 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 going to do that and that was kind of the idea and then we were first of all we we checked with Chris if he's fine with it he agreed and then it was like okay so what are we going to do we basically have no money we don't really have let's say uh, a contact or like much experience with applying to traditional film funds or grants and also, the other thing is that usually those, those as at least in Germany, those, uh, those processes take a lot of time. It's bureaucracy. Usually you start like, let's say, half a year or even a year before applying and you have to wait for the, till the call ends. Till the, uh, so that kind of stuff. And uh, for example, when Chris agreed, he basically told us that uh, in a few months he will be in Europe okay. with, uh, with a tour that he was uh, um, 
organizing with Maman Sani together. And we thought, okay, if he's already coming to Europe, well, we have to go and meet him. Right, so that, that knocked out a bunch of other options. Totally. You want to go, you got to do it, right? Totally, yeah. yeah. And uh, he didn't pass Germany, but he, he, was, uh, he was stopping in, I think, Brussels and Amsterdam, which is not too far. So right. basically... It's also in Sweden, right? That was in the Swedish countryside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we didn't go all the way up to Sweden, but when he came down, um, we, we, we went to see him. And, and that was basically the first shooting blog. There was this European tour of Maman Sani where, I mean, only a little bit is left in the film, but, um, but for that, we basically used our own money and we did that and we shot like first interviews with him and with Maman. Okay, so you did this out of your own pocket then? That was, that we did out of our own pocket. Okay. <clears throat> and the good thing after that was that we had some material and then, I mean, we, knew a little bit about the option of crowdfunding and we thought, okay, maybe that's something that can be done, let's say, fast or within like one or two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I mean, if it goes well, we maybe have enough to to go for uh, to the trip to, to Niger. Now you have to have, when you do a crowdfunding, you usually set a target, yeah. which I guess is normally theoretically reflective of how much you yeah. need. For, yeah. So how did you, did you come up with a budget in advance or did you just kind of I mean, we, we calculated it, I think, very, how would you say it? I, I, I think we calculated it quite realistic towards like the shooting blocks, but we more or less excluded the complete post-production okay. because we knew that this, first of all, takes usually the most money if you do it professionally. Okay. Um, and then we set it to around 18,000 that we needed for like uh, the travels, the flight costs, the, the, the money that we need on the, on, on the, sh on the, the ground. Just to get the Yeah, right? yeah. And, uh, and we also wanted to do the, the trip to the States to film him in his, uh, in his, in his headquarter in, in Portland. And that was for us something like we put it in the calculation, but it was kind of an option depending on like how much we raise. Okay. Because we knew we could also probably make a film that just takes place during the travels in, in Niger. Um, so that's how we uh, started and with the material that we shot with Maman, we could uh, do a trailer, like a little crowdfunding trailer with actual material okay. that we shot. So that was a good thing. And, uh, and we started and it went well, I think, in my sense. Uh, we didn't raise, uh, of course, everything. But uh, we got a good start. I mean, it was mainly... You said about, about a quarter. Of what yeah, you yeah. Did, it's right? like it was about like, I think, 4,000 euros that we raised through the crowdfunding. Now, there, one of the criticisms of the crowdfund, crowdfunding models, not for, well, not necessarily against you guys, yeah. but is that, well, it really yeah, it begs your friends and your family, yeah. but it's hard to get that crowdfunding to spill over to yeah. people. What was your experience? We had the same experience. I mean, in the end, I think most of the money came from just like a close circle around us that we knew. But I'm not sure if that is the problem of the whole crowdfunding model or if it's more like that. I have to say we're not that, let's say, socialized, especially in like digital social, social media, network, yeah, 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 that kind of thing. So maybe we just didn't spread it enough or didn't had the right, the right contacts or something to make it more, more visible in the net. Um, and also, I mean, still, Chris and his label, even at that time, was way just uh, like a, a niche thing that... Did, did they also participate in helping to spread the word? I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, Chris wanted this project to happen as well. I mean, he knew kind of that it would be a good promotion as well for his label. So he helped in, in the sense that he was also like posting it and like telling his kind of like followers that, that this is going to happen and they should support. Um, but yeah, in the end, and you know, four thousand is enough to make a decision. Totally, and, and I thought what you guys did next was very clever. So yeah, yeah. What, you know, what you have four thousand, you need about three quarters more. What yeah, do you do? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we knew that we could uh, that we could start the, or pay the, the the flights to to Niger with with that money, and uh, but then like something that we like a person that we contacted even earlier is like a producer that we knew from a previous project and he's quite a um, let's say a big producer in Germany and we a film producer a film producer yeah he big screen yeah yeah he mainly produces feature films German films for the movie for the theaters not the, for TV or both 
no, mainly f like for for theaters, for cinema, yeah. And um, and he's well known because he 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 was collaborating with a uh, kind of a famous German director since a long time and releasing his films, or producing his films, and uh, and so we got in touch with him and asked him if he would actually help us with the with the crowdfunding a little bit. But he was busy at the time, so he kind of missed the, the crowdfunding thing. And then like a little bit later on, he, uh, he got back to us. He was like, hey, I just still want to make your film because I somehow forgot to, to help you. Uh, so what's the status? And then we told him about like, this is what we want to do. This is what we got. So we're definitely going to do it, but we also need some money more. Do you have ideas? Um, how we could find money? And then he now this, now this, since you have the, f the, the first 4,000 or so yeah. that covers your film costs, right? To go to Niger and import them. Mm -hmm. So you're look, basically looking for an, another 10,000 or so to do the post-production? No, we were basically looking, I mean, those 4,000 covers, let's say the flights. But Just the flights, okay. Yeah, more or less, and maybe a little bit more, but also we knew that we had to rent some, uh, some equipment that we didn't own ourselves. Um, of course, like you have to pay a translator and a guide in, in, in Niger. You need like uh, sleeping, uh, like accommodation costs and, and food and everything. And five weeks is even in West Africa, it's 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 not yeah, that it's cheap. Um, so, and also, I mean, like you can, I don't know, it's like you. C but to us, when you when you plan such a project, you can always like picture it. On a on a very low scale in terms of what, what equipment you use and like how everything is going to be, or you picture it, let's say, in a little bit advanced way, where you when you know you got a little bit of money, you can maybe uh, rent one microphone more, or one lavalier more, and maybe one lens more, so you can make it a little bit nicer, maybe. So that was kind of like our two ways that we had, like depending on how much money we will get. So when we were in touch with this producer and uh, we were kind of um, showing him our expose and telling him about what we want to do, he got pretty much interested in the project and he said, okay guys, uh, I think I'm going to produce it and I will provide you with the, 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 the rest of the cost that you might have. Okay. But I also want you to make it good so you better rent another lens so that you have a good picture and a good sound and everything because yeah don't come back with like crappy material right so so he invested and the thing is that he uh, uh, his production company had some uh, some money on the side that he could invest in this project so therefore we could also start right away there wasn't like because I mean a lot of times production companies also of course have to apply right. for for, right. for grants you're not looking for millions you're looking of course, it was very low still, um, but so that was the that was the uh, the situation and how we could start just right away and go on. You finished your film, and you have your investor on board. Mm -hmm. So from a, just from a, like the financial aspect, yeah. the, you know, the crowdfunding was given to you. Yeah. What what has to happen to the film for it to be for the producer yeah. um, at least a break even, or does the even producer even really care? I mean, of course, uh, he, he would love to, to see his, his investment coming back. Um, for that to happen, what we hoped in the beginning, I think, and which is always, uh, at least like in Germany, the, the easiest way to, to get your investment back is if you could sell it to a TV station okay. so that they would air it because that would, let's say, bring in uh, just like with one time like a, a specific yeah. amount of money. Yeah. Um, so we tried uh, pitching it to TV stations but didn't really succeed, maybe for several reasons, I'm not sure. Some TV stations already produced smaller uh, parts or like smaller films about similar topics. Okay. There was stuff about Mali and, uh, and the music there so some of them weren't really interested because they already had something and also something that's a I mean, not a problem, but it's just something that that keeps coming more and more is that the TV stations don't really buy ready-made films anymore. I mean, either they want to be involved from an earlier stage so that they, they could also have, like, let's say, uh, an impact on, on how this film will be made and how it will look like in the end, um, uh, or they just produce something on their own already. 
so with people that are uh, that are employed. So what are your options? Do you have to sell enough DVDs to make it exciting, or what? You know, how? What's yeah. your strategy now? Now you've done the film, yeah. and the fun part is over, right? Yeah. The creative part. What's your strategy to make it? You know, for your producer, uh, at least a break even, so he comes and says, "All right, I'll, yeah. I'll help you out the next project." Well, I mean, you kind of do what you what you can. What we what we did from the beginning was that we started a festival tour which mainly aims to spread the, the word about the film and maybe attract buyers or, or distributors or people that are having an interest in, in documentaries. So uh, that worked kind of well. I mean, we screened, I think, already around the film on 25 festivals or something. Yeah. So it really, over the last year, made a tour almost worldwide. I mean, we had screenings in Canada, we had uh, a lot of screenings in Europe, we had screenings in Africa, so that was that was nice and it's still going on, but uh, but like a really good deal so far didn't really and you're happen. Money off of that, right? No, so I mean sometimes you get a little fee, but I mean it's not something that would cover the costs of the film in a, in a, in a, in a long term. Have you tried more, um, let's say, bare bones approaches, like I don't know, you know, Take it on tour yourself and invite people to come in, pass yeah. the hat, and collect yeah. a couple hundred euros on the fly. Or yeah, I mean, not in not in yeah. that sense, but but yeah, we, I mean, we try to do a lot of screenings uh, as we can, and we also, I mean, I spent I think the last year almost investing two days a week in just promoting and the film and trying to bring it on uh, into music clubs, on music festivals, film festivals, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. And besides that, I mean, what's good is that we found a, a world sales uh, agency for the for the film. They're also in Berlin, mm -hmm. and they they do the same basically. I mean, they try and they have a bit more contacts. It's in their catalog. Uh, it's on on the table of a few video on demand platforms. Mm -hmm. So I mean, maybe it also just needs a little bit more time that somebody says, hey, okay, I'm gonna. I'm going to buy it or I'm going to release, maybe someone is doing a small DVD batch or something. But is that even a viable, now, I mean, now we're just uh, uh, you know, getting to the next, the last question I have yeah. is, um, well, uh, besides, uh, well, I have two more questions. Yeah. The, other question, I mean, the last question is, you know, you're, you're, you're selling DVDs, yeah. but who buys DVDs nowadays? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and for, or even, for example, when I'm thinking about my films, yeah. uh, you know, the chance of me you know, the time and effort to put in to make a film that actually is conceived for the big screen in the yeah, theater. Yeah. Uh, no, so, I, I mean, I only produce for the internet, yeah, yeah. you know, so I know my projects are much limited in scope, but at least I know my audience and I can reach them yeah, yeah. without. So why did you choose to, was it just your big dream to put this on a big screen and with the surround sound? Or what, did you have a conscious decision in the beginning, this is our audience, we want to go here, or did you just kind of go with your passion for this one? Um, I mean, I think that we still kind of love like cinema and the idea of it. And so the project that we did before, and I think also the upcoming projects that we're going to do, will be targeted first for, let's say, screenings and uh, for bigger screens and, and let's say a cinema atmosphere. But of course, uh, it's highly difficult and also I mean what I haven't said yet is that this whole project was mainly done uh, without getting paid right, sir. throughout the whole process which is something when you think that you spend three years in making this film I mean with ons and offs of course because in between we had to go work like just normally to, to pay our rents and stuff uh, and now even like this last year, which is the promotion of the film, which consumes another huge amount of time for really, I mean, okay, I got to travel a few times, like coming here, for example, uh, but that's the, the only benefit so far. And uh, so in that sense, in like how to, how to make a living out of projects like that, I have to say it's, it's highly difficult. Right. And, uh, and I'm not sure how, how this will uh, yeah, continue, or like, what's the model? I mean, I still kind of, um, I like the idea more 
of doing those passionate and personal and maybe important projects to myself than rather than to let's say sell myself to a to a TV station and work as an employee and I have to do things that I maybe not want to do. So I idealize that maybe a little bit, this kind of free artist uh, filmmaking thing. But on the other hand, like in terms of like if that kind of provides my living, it's but then again, what's the question? Why even, why not shoot for a different um, technological format? I mean, you don't have to have, you can have a great quality. I mean, like if you take Chris's example. Yeah. He's really not producing for, uh, you know, the super high end yeah. iTunes market. Yeah. I mean, he's bringing it out on vinyl. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what you're filming yeah. on vinyl, and he's recording it with a, a Zoom or yeah. something yeah. small. Yeah. And uh, it's about communicating the emotion of the music. And so I thought maybe you'd be inspired by his model to do a different form yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I mean, now you've got video clips and people are watching it on their phones. And I mean, there's so many different opportunities. Why be focused on cinema? Whew. <laughs> um, I mean, I have to agree with you. It's like, I think it's something that we're just not yet very much experienced in. So something that we might have to uh, uh, examine further and, 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 and see if, if, if we can adapt somehow to that. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm really not very much an internet person, okay. so I'm, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult and still, I mean, like how, how, how to make a living in the end with like, online videos that you share or like something I think it maybe ends up at the same point even though maybe we could reach an, a wider audience but I mean I think we have to try uh -huh, okay. somehow okay. so I'm I'm not saying like no we are purely uh, cinema and, and nothing else but uh, yeah it's just a new new sure. discovery I think that we have to make so final question I know the collective is, it's not a company, mm -hmm. there's no uh, manifesto, yeah. so either what is your next personal project dream mm -hmm. or what's the collective's next project to make? <laughs> uh, well, as I said, they're like, the projects are kind of like going uh, in different paces, so for example now the, the project that Lisa was working on is about to be released. Uh, hopefully in winter or in beginning of next year. So this is something that's coming up, a uh, new film, let's see, it's something completely different. It has also a topic which relates to Africa, it's about oral history, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a very experimental uh, art film, a bit like installation-like. So uh, we're gonna see what, what kind of context that may, might bring. Um, and then there's a new project planned again in a collaboration with Chris and with some of the musicians uh, from Niger because uh, also Chris started working as a filmmaker uh, in like the last three years and he already made two films together with like the Tura community in Agadez, uh, two feature films and uh, we are about to do a third one which probably will be on a little bigger scale and that's why we teamed up again and uh, we kind of trying to do that in spring, early summer next year. So uh, well, stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned Please. and follow all the social media <laughs> or write a letter if you're old school. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have Chris on our side who's a bit more experienced with that, so, so that's his part. <laughs> all right. But no, sure. Well, thank you very much, Florian. It's been super interesting. And uh, the, the, the film is, has, is great, uh, great fun. And the sounds are amazing, so... Yes, I mean, dig the sound, like, it's, uh, it's online, uh, yeah. that one is yeah. everywhere, I think. Yeah. So thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Great.